So that's the idea. And so the idea as well is that the organizing principle that brings you into this optimally functioning hierarchy is your commitment to truth, to accurately represent what it is that you experience. And that's again, you know how Piaget talked about the fundamental truth as a process rather than as a state or a fact. It's the case for Rogerian phenomen phenomenology as well, and you can kind of understand that because of course therapists are dealing with people, living people, and life is a process, not a state. And so Rogers was concentrating very much on the process, which he regarded as absolutely crucial, and believed that the process, the process properly implemented, would bring about the best possible organization, and then would update that organization as necessary too. So, it's a radical idea, but I would also say that it's fundamentally rooted in his Protestant Christianity, because one of the tenets of Christianity is that the word orders chaos. And so that idea was lurking at the bottom of Roger's conceptual structure, and you know, he was intelligent enough to articulate it fully in a modern way. But that's still where it came from. Now Rogers also believed some other things. And this is where I think he gets a little bit optimistic. But, but he's no fool. So Rogers is one of those optimists you really have to contend with. Now, he believed, and I think this is a classical Protestant belief as, as well, that what evil was was basically the absence of good. And that people had a strong... In, intrinsic impulse towards the good that you could help them realize. And the way you helped them realize that was by setting the preconditions for the emergence of that good. And he believed that the preconditions were <coughs> the provision of a space for communication where there was no judgment in the sense of rejection. And so, here's the Rogerian theory with regards to therapeutic endeavor. Now the first thing is, and this seems critical, and I think Rogers was right about this, that the client has to want to change. And this is, this is a funny thing about therapy, because my observation has been that it's not something you can impose on people unless they've decided that things could be better and that alterations in, in, in something they're doing might make it better, you, it's a non-starter. And so I've had clients who were court ordered to attend therapy and that's just a complete waste of time. <laughs> Especially if they're more on the psychopathic end of things because you just, if they don't want to change, they're not going to learn. And this is actually another Rogerian principle and because Rogers had an educational philosophy as well, and the educational philosophy was students will not learn things that are not relevant to them. And so, one of the teacher's duties was to make the material at hand relevant, because that would help the student remember it. Why remember it if it's not relevant? It's one of the things I try to do in my lectures. I try to tell people when I'm lecturing why they should know this, and the fundamental answer always, if you push it down far enough, is that if you know this, your life will go better and so will the life of people around you. So you should listen because then there's some things that are sharp and pointy that you won't run into while you're wandering around in the fog. So, and, and that's the fundamental issue. It's, it's necessary to know these things. And so, if you're dealing with someone who hasn't decided that there's something wrong and that they have something to do about it and that maybe they could change and that would make things better, you're not going anywhere. And Rogers would also say that's actually a precondition for a relationship, period. Because he didn't really make much of a distinction between a therapeutic relationship and a genuine relationship, because he thought the genuine relationships were therapeutic. And so, one of the principles that you can extract from that is that if you're in a relationship, one useful proposition is that, well, you're pretty perfect, but you're probably not quite as perfect as you could be. And so it's possible that your partner, no matter how deeply flawed they are, might now and then have something to say to you that would, if you incorporated, would bring you to an even higher state of perfection, right? And so that's, that means you have to listen. And it, it's worse than that. And this, again, is a Rogerian observation. You might have to help them criticize you, because maybe they're not very good at it. 
you know, and so there's something they're trying to tell you in their stumbly way, and it's, it's an actual thing, but they can't articulate it, and so it would be easy for you just to, especially if you're trying to use language instrumentally and to get away with it, just to, well, you could even make fun of the way they're poorly articulating the problem. That's a really good one, because then you can convince them not to do such things in the future. But if you take the other stance, which is, well, I've got some things to learn, and you've got some things to learn, and you've got some things to teach me, and I've got some things to teach you, and God only knows when that's going to happen, but it might happen. So the object of the conversation is for each person to help the other person make their point. You know, and that's a lot different than winning the argument. And I can tell you one thing. You will not win an argument with any intimate partner ever. Because you're not playing the game of the argument. You're playing the game of iterated arguments across time. And so if you win an argument, you just set up another one. Winning and solving the problem aren't the same thing. So from a Rogerian perspective, winning would be the maintenance of your current self-structure at the cost of failure to integrate some disintegrated element of the phenomenological realm. Maybe it'd be the unhappiness of your partner. That might be one of them. Now, you can, if you win the argument, that's the rationalization issue fundamentally. You don't have to change, but the fact is you do have to change because the way you are is giving rise to this situation, and that's not going to change unless you fix it. So winning an argument and fixing something, those are completely different things. You fix the thing, it goes away. And often, you know, couples have to have conflict because there's no difference between conflict and thinking. Thinking is a form of war. It's just that you, in, you, you make it an interior form of war, right? You can't have a, a couple without conflict because life is different, difficult, and people differ from one another. So they have different value structures. And so you can't just ignore that. You have to set up a dialogue because it's not necessarily obvious who's right. Of course, Rogers believed that in the therapeutic realm, too. So he thought of therapy as something that emerged as a consequence of the adoption of certain axiomatic presuppositions, and those were things could be better than they are, and you could make them that way, and that's also true for me. And then the next presumption is, well, maybe we can figure out how to do that in a collaborative, with collaborative communication. So Rogers believed that the therapist was just as transformed during the therapeutic process as the person. In fact, if that wasn't happening, then whatever was happening wasn't the kind of healing therapy that Rogers would like to have happen. And he also said that's, I'll, I'll read you something he said later, but he also pointed out quite strongly that that's why people don't really like to listen. You know, like, maybe there's some flaw in your self-structure at some fundamental level, fundamentally axiomatic level. You know, maybe you're narcissistic, that'd be a good one. And, you know, if you listen to people, they're going to tell you you're narcissistic. Well, you don't want to find that out, because it's going to blow a huge hole in your... It's going to blow a huge hole in your self-structure. That's not very fun. But, hypothetically, that beats running into the obstacles that you will run into if you're narcissistic, repeatedly as you move forward through life. So you can either live with your flaws or correct them. That's the, and the, 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 the pathway to correction is dialogue, communication. So 